The year was 597 BC, and the unthinkable had happened. God's people had been conquered. For centuries now, the small kingdom of Judah had been caught in a power struggle between the three more powerful and much larger kingdoms of Egypt, Assyria, and Babylon. Each of these three kingdoms tormented Judah as they sought to be the superpower of their time. In recent years, the balance of power had started to shift. Babylon had conquered Assyria, and now they had set their eyes on Egypt. And small little Judah lie in between. The recent kings of Judah had been a wicked and fickle bunch. They would pledge their loyalty to Babylon. They would pay their tribute only to then turn their loyalty towards Egypt. When the threat of Babylon had grown distant. See, during this time in Israel's history, this time in Judah's history, the kings were more interested in playing politics than being the people of God. And they would pay a price for that. The prophets had been warning of this day. They they told them that this was coming. But those in leadership, they were just slow to believe it. They had gotten lost in the, their vision had been clouded by the narrative of this world. And they had lost sight of the fact that God was trying to tell a much larger story. A story where Judah was to be, play a lead role. But now, in 597 B.C., that role was about to change. God would use the wicked nation of Babylon to discipline his people. Only this time, Babylon was going to require far more than just tribute. Not only was Babylon going to come in and walk away with the wealth of Judah, they were going to walk away with their sons and daughters as well. And over the next 10 to 20 years, Babylon would return again and again to claim Judah's brightest and their most fair. Any youth that showed potential for, for leadership, any youth that showed intelligence, Babylon would take. They would take back to Babylon, and there that youth would have to live in exile in Babylon. Scripture tells us that when Babylon was finished, only the poorest of the poor remained in the land. I can only imagine that for those that were carried off into exile, that it must have been a jarring experience. In an instant, the culture around them changed. No longer did they have the, no longer did they have the temple rising in the distance, reminding them of their purpose and their their uh, privilege. But instead, they were in a foreign land, serving a foreign king, that worshipped false gods. See, if these exiles were going to remain true to who they were, if they were going to remain God's people, if they were going to hold on to their purpose and their mission, well, then that drive was going to have to come from within because there was nothing in the culture around them that was going to support them in that endeavor. I think exile is a fitting description of what God's people are experiencing today in our time. Now, I I don't want to overstate this. I I don't believe that there is a point-for-point comparison between the current church and Judah. And I don't want to suggest that God is somehow disciplining us in this time. I know that many have suggested that, but I don't have any divine knowledge of that. And so I, I don't want to speak to that. But I do know that for many of you, You have seen the culture around you change over the course of a lifetime. It's gone from being a culture that at least on the surface was largely uh, Christian. It supported a Christian worldview. It, It supported Christian ethics to one that is foreign and even hostile to the things of God. Others of you, well, your journey's been different. You knew from the start that to, to 
walk with Christ was to oppose the world. And so you look at the situation and you think the church, the church has always been here. The church has always existed in exile. Some of us feel as if we've been carried off into exile in our sleep where others feel that, that this has always been the status quo. And regardless of your experience, I believe that exile is an adequate description uh, of what we're experiencing because there is little in our culture that will support our desire to live a godly life. Our culture doesn't share our worldview. It doesn't support our, uh, our values, nor does it even respect them. We can't rewind the clock and minister to, to the culture of 50 years ago. God has placed us in this time and this place for this purpose, that we would minister to this culture. And as we all know, that can be difficult. It can be difficult to minister to this culture because, well, let's face it, this, this culture is taking us places we never wanted to go. It can be difficult to minister to this culture because, well, this culture, it's often hostile to our, our message and our values. It can be difficult to minister to this culture because, well, let's face it, we, we often feel robbed and marginalized. And that can fill us with anger. But God has called us to love and to serve. For the next four weeks, we're going to be looking at the first six chapters of the book of Daniel. Because I believe in those chapters, we see a good example of, of how to live in exile, how to live a godly life in the midst of a culture that doesn't share your, our values or, or our, our ethics. But not only do we see a, a good example of how to live in exile, we also see a good example of how to minister to the culture ar around us. Read with me out of Daniel 1. Starting with verse 1, it says this, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into, the, into his hands, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the storehouse of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. Young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. The first thing I want us to recognize as we move into this study is this, is that while in exile, we are immersed in a, in a toxic and yet tempting culture. Does that sound like today? We are immersed in, into a culture that is both toxic and yet at the same time, it, it tempts us. For those taken in exile, they found themselves immersed into Babylonian culture. The touchstones of their Jewish culture had all been removed, stripped away. And what replaced them was clearly Babylonian. No longer would they have uh, family and, and tradition guiding their choices and, and, and habits. No longer would they be able to have the consistency of worship connecting them with God. Now all those things had been removed and Babylon replaced them with the good things of Babylon. See, these exiles, they, they weren't they weren't mistreated, at least not in the harshest sense of the, of the word. Babylon had a plan. They, they, were taking the best, they weren't taking the best of Judah so that they could mistreat them. They were taking the best of Judah so that they could court them. They would bring them to Babylon, and after they had taught them to be good Babylonians, they would return them back to Judea so that they would be, well, Jewish Babylonians. For those in exile, the easy path 
was going to lead them deeper and deeper and deeper into the Babylonian way of life. If they were going to hold on to their identity as God's people, if they were going to hold on to their purpose and their mission, well, that was going to be hard. That, that was going to be difficult. That was possibly even going to be painful. And yet that is exactly what they must do. I think the same thing's true for us, living the Christian life in a culture that's hostile to the things of God. It's going to come with difficulty. It's going to come with sacrifice. This world is going to offer you all kinds of pleasure to compromise. It's going to do everything that it can to lure you into compromise so, so that you abandon your identity as God's people. I think that's what makes living in exile so hard. It's not just the threat of persecution that's a challenge. It's the promise of reward. The old carrot and the stick. It's a pretty effective combination. And, and any one of us can find ourselves coerced by these tools if we don't live intentional lives. But Daniel and his friends, they somehow navigate this. And they navigate it well. Today I want to look at what enabled Daniel to stand his ground. What is it about Daniel and his friends that enabled him to live in a culture completely hostile to his values and his worldview, and yet he remained true to, to who he was? I believe that Daniel stood his ground because he knew who he was. He understood not just who he was as a 6th century Jew, but he understood his kingdom identity. He understood who he was in the kingdom of God. And as he held on to that identity, that's the thing that steered his course. That's the thing that enabled him to live the life that God had called him to. Even in the midst of exile. In light of this truth, I think what the Babylonians do next is pretty interesting. In verse 6 it says, Among those who were chosen were some from Judah. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names. To Daniel, the name Belshazzar. To Hananiah, Shadrach. To Mishael, Meshach. And to Azariah, Abednego. I think it's interesting that the Babylonians renamed Daniel and his friends because each of these names speak to the power and magnificent of a, magnificence of our God. The name Daniel means God is my judge. Hananiah means God is gracious. Michelle means who is God, who is what God is. A question speaking to God's uniqueness and to his power. Azariah means God has helped. See, these names, they were reminders of their kingdom identity. More importantly, these names were reminders to these men of who God was and how powerful and faithful he is. And so Babylon had to change them. Babylon had to change their names. Daniel, they changed to Belshazzar, which means protector of the king. Hananiah, they changed to Shadrach, which means in the command of a coup. A coup being a false god that the Babylonians worshipped. Mishael was changed to Meshach, which is, who is what a coup is? Creative, huh? Azariah is changed to Abednego, which meant the servant of Nago. See, by renaming these men, the Babylonians are seeking to redefine who they are. Right? They, they are seeking to take away their kingdom identity and the purpose for which God had called them, and they're trying to replace it with something that reflects the priorities of Babylon. This is what I want us to take from this. I believe that this culture seeks to define you. It seeks to rename you. Humanity is unique in creation in that we live, as we live our lives, we, we engage in this constant search for identity. And we come to understand 
our identity. We come to understand who we are as we come to understand our purpose, our people, and our position. And I'm telling you, I chose those words not because I thought they were catchy. Not, the fact that they're all P's is just a coincidence. No, those are the three things. Those are the substance at which we build our identity about. We build it around our purpose, around our people, and around our position. And if you're a believer, well, God has already defined those things for you. If you're a believer, your purpose, well, guess what? You're an ambassador to the loss on behalf of God. We live and breathe to give hope to the hurting. We live and breathe to give healing to the wounded. That's our purpose. Our people? Well, our people are the, the people of God. Those that are living and seeking a, an authentic relationship with the Lord, they're our people because we're on the same journey. We have fellowship because we're walking the same path. Our position, well, this is the best one yet. We're forgiven. We're sinners, but we're forgiven. Adopted heirs to the kingdom. Through Christ, we are children of God. That's who you are if you are a believer. But in the absence of that bedrock, in the absence of those truths defined by our creator, we will build our identities on sand. And our culture is all too happy to provide the building materials. Our culture will tell, have you build your identity on brands, on sports teams, on products, whatever they're selling. The marketing of this age taps into our need for identity and they tell us, this is what you need. This is who you are. And it leads us down that road of materialism and selfishness only to take us inevitably to disappointment because it's sand. This culture would have you defined by your social status, your job, your education, your sexuality, your political affiliation. I could keep going on and on. The list that we could put here is infinite, and yet they're all the same. They're sand. They are ineffective and incapable of, of, of showing us who God created us to be. It's like building a hurricane shelter out of popsicle sticks. Sure, you could probably do it. But is it the best way? Is it going to stand the test? Is it going to withhold uh, up? It's going to hold together in the midst of the storm and the pressure of time. My guess is that you would find it seriously lacking. And for many of us, we have. We've engaged in that quest to build our identities. We have worked hard. The sandcastles we have constructed have been magnificent. And yet, at the first wave, they seem to crumble. Or we stand and we look at the masterpiece, and it's just not what we had dreamed. Just a few minutes ago, I told you that God has defined our identity in a broad sense by defining our purpose, our people, and our place. I want you to know that God has not just left it there. God doesn't just define our our identity in a broad sense, he, he walks with us. And as he does, he shows us who we are as individuals. See, I think just our identity in, in a broad sense would be, well, it would be, it would leave us wanting. Because we're, we are individuals. We have individual stories and, and individual talents. And, and we seek to understand not just the broad sense of what our purpose is, but what's my individual purpose? I don't want just a, a concept of who my people are. I want to know, I want to know their names. Right? As we walk with Christ, we begin to walk out that path. We begin to walk out that story. And we live out our kingdom identities as we walk hand in hand with the Lord. 
And so this is the key thought for today. This is the bottom line. This is what I want you to grab hold of, and I want you to take home, and I want you to talk about, and I want you to unpack. Is this, that we come to understand our kingdom identity as we experience intimacy with God. You want to know what helped Daniel stand the test? It's because he knew his God. He experienced intimacy with him on a regular basis. As we'll see in the weeks to come, Daniel's story is a story of a man who's a great man, a man of wisdom, of character and strength, a man who counseled kings and yet stood and <clears throat> faced incredible persecution and let me remain true to his kingdom identity. We get the first glimpse of this in Daniel 1, when Daniel and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, are faced with a choice. They're given a choice to eat the king's food. Now, the text doesn't tell us why they objected to eating the king's food. Most likely, they objected because the meat had been sacrificed to idols. And they viewed, they, they believed that this would dishonor God. And so, Daniel commits himself to only eating vegetables and water. Now, that's a man willing to suffer for the Lord, right? And God blesses that commitment. God gives Daniel greater fitness, and he increases his talent because Daniel has had integrity. Daniel is living out his kingdom identity, and so God blesses it. Later in the book of Daniel, we see that he is a man of prayer. That three times a day, Daniel would go into his room, he would face Jerusalem, and he would pray. I don't think Daniel did that because he felt like he had to. I think Daniel prayed three times a day because he needed to. He needed those touch points of intimacy with his God because he was surrounded by a culture that tempted him, a culture that wanted to lure him away, a, a culture that was pressuring him in unimaginable ways to compromise. And so I think three times a day he set that time aside, not because he wanted to be the good Jewish boy. No, he needed to connect with his maker. He needed that intimacy with the Lord. And as a result, when he knew God's voice, when persecution and trouble comes, Daniel doesn't walk it alone because he has a relationship with God. And that relationship is the thing that enables him to endure. I don't know why this is true, but, but I think we've all seen it. That, that somehow faith easily becomes about all the do's and the don'ts. Somehow, in our quest to find God, we, we lose God in the midst of, of religion. And so I want to remind you today that the starting point for your faith, it isn't a, group, a bunch of actions. The starting point for your faith, it isn't the right theological beliefs. The starting point for your faith is an encounter with God. It's a relationship with with God. See, Daniel didn't reject the king's food because he had to. He rejected it because it was an expression of who he was. Through his relationship with God, he had come to understand his kingdom identity, and eating food sacrificed to idols was just incompatible with that identity. We often get it so backwards. We expend so much energy trying to live a righteous life so that we can have a relationship with God. And the fact is that apart from a relationship from God, we can't live a righteous life. It's especially true in exile, in a culture that's hostile, a culture that is toxic and yet tempting. It's our intimacy with God that empowers us to live a righteous life in a culture that doesn't share our values or ethics. Jesus explains it this way. Jesus says this. He says, Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. 
I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. If we're going to be successful in living God-honoring lives in the midst of exile, we need to know who we are. The only way we're going to come to know who we are is we are going to pull close to the creator that made us. But we live in a culture that's pretty good at keeping us busy. We live in a culture that's pretty good at keeping us distracted. And so if we're going to know who we are, if we're going to pull close to God, if we're going to experience intimacy with God, it's not going to happen by itself. It's only going to happen if, if we live intentional lives, if we make intentional choices. We've just entered a new season. The Christmas of fall was in the air. As sad as I am to admit it, this week reminded us that, man, we're, we're entering a new time of the year. For many of us, our routines have changed. As kids have gone back to school or, 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 or started uh, study habits at home. I want to challenge you as we enter this new season to embrace some, some habits. Maybe they're new habits for you. Maybe they're old habits that you've let slide. But I want to challenge you to, to embrace the habit of study. Get into God's Word on a daily basis. Now, don't make it a legalistic, oh, I have to do this or I'm a bad. No, no, make it a touch point of intimacy with the Lord. I want to see, I want to hear from my, my Maker. Right? For me, what this looks like is every morning I, I come into work, I make a pot of coffee, and that first cup of coffee, I don't do anything until I've drank one cup of coffee. That coffee belongs to the Lord. And, and as I drink it, I read a selection of Scripture, and, and I just pray, trying to focus my attention onto God's kingdom and away from my kingdom. That's my habit. I encourage you to set up your own. It doesn't have to be elaborate. You don't have to spend two, three hours parsing out the Greek. Just open God's word and let him speak to you. The second habit that I want to encourage you towards is prayer. And I want to challenge you not just to go to God with a long list of requests. I want you to go to God with an open heart. I want you to make your time of prayer a time of reflection where you listen and you let God speak to you. You can do this in your car on your commute. You can do this on your lunch hour. You can do this, you can do a walk and talk with the Lord. Get some exercise while you're at it. But make prayer a habit in your life. Again, back to Daniel. Daniel stood the test because he knew intimacy with his Lord and he knew intimacy with his Lord because he kneeled three times a day. He had put those touch points in his life and he benefited from it. The last thing that I want, habit that I want to encourage us to is towards accountability. We are far too isolated in this world and that's especially true now. We need to make a point to connect with someone each week, to talk about what the Lord is teaching us, to, to check in, and most importantly, just to pray with one another. Now, church, it's time to start small groups again. And I realize, I understand that we're in the middle of a pandemic, and I understand that we have to take precautions. But but. We can't wait a year for this to blow over to be present in each other's lives. We need each other now. And so this is my challenge to you. You mask up, get your sanitizer ready, you do whatever you got to do to be safe, but be present in each other's lives. And if it's just not safe for you, if you just cannot meet face to face with somebody, then meet with somebody through another way. And again, be intentional. Don't just make a, 
oh, a five-minute phone call when you think of it. No, you put that on your calendar. You carve out that time and make it significant. Because not only do you need somebody, somebody needs you. For some of us, I know you're feeling lost in exile. You're feeling frustrated, disillusioned, angry. Maybe your life has come to be full of doubt. For some of you, you have lost your kingdom identity. There, there was a time when, when it felt solid. I mean, you had hold of it and you understood where it was taking you, but now that's become distant and it's become elusive. I'm willing to bet if that's you, it's been a while since you've had a heart-to-heart with the Lord. So I want to challenge you to that end. Pull close to God. Scripture tells us that if we seek him, we will find him. If we knock, the door will be opened. If that's you today, I want to remind you that Daniel's placement in exile was not outside of God's knowledge, but rather it was by his design. God had a role for Daniel to play, and so God placed him in exile intentionally. God wanted Daniel in exile because he had a purpose for him. The same thing's true for you. God has us here intentionally. And the changing landscape of our culture is not a mystery to God. And as foreign as it feels to us, God has placed us here in this time, in this place, for this purpose. God has a role for us to play. But to live it out, we have to hold tightly to our kingdom identity. We must hold tightly to who God has created us to be. And we're only going to come to know who we are as we experience intimacy with the one who made us. I want to encourage you, if you are here today and you're listening to us talk about this relationship with the Lord and you've never given your life to the Lord, I want to encourage you to that end today. Maybe you're listening and, and you're just, you're just, you have questions. I want to encourage you to, to, to I invite you to a conversation. Send me an email, text message, phone call. I would love to help you make those next steps. But if you're here today and you know that I don't need another conversation, I just need, I just need to, to drive the stake. I just need to, to make my choice. Well, the baptismal is always ready. And we invite you to come forward during our closing song. Let's pray. Uh, dear Lord, I come before you and I just thank you for the example of Daniel. Lord, most of all, I, I come before you grateful that you, in, you have chosen to, to overcome the chasm that separated us from you, that, that you have come into this world so that we could have a relationship with you. Lord, I pray that that each of us here today and everyone listening online, Lord, I pray that we would, we would be intentional in pursuing that intimacy with you. Lord, I pray that as we open your word, Lord, that we wouldn't just be uh, engaging in a, in a spiritual task, Lord, but that, 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 Lord, we would hear your voice, the truth of those pages, that it would fill us with hope, and Lord, that just drive us deeper and deeper in our relationship with you. Lord, I ask that you would knit us together as a body. There are so many things seeking to divide us in this time. Lord, I pray that you would knit us together, that you would keep us whole, and that we would find, uh, again, just intimacy with you as we do life together. Lord, we ask these things in your holy name. Amen.